Hi everyone, in today's video I'm going to be showing you how I did this pastel portrait of Freddy the Cavalier. I did this portrait a little while ago but despite that I still always draw in the eyes first. That really hasn't ever changed from when I started drawing many years ago to now I always like to make sure that I map in the eye first. The reason being it's where all of that emotion and expression is stemming from so I want to make sure I've got this right before I tackle any other part of the portrait. I always want to map in the shape of the eye first so I will do my general outline, I'll map in my pupil and if there's a particularly bright highlight I will put that in with a white pastel pencil first. Once I'm happy with the eye, as you can see here, I start building up my base layer. Now I'm using my oval shaped soft tool and I'm holding this at times close up to the sponge or further away on the end of the handle. There are a couple of reasons why. When I want to be a little bit more controlled with the movements, I will hold it much closer to the sponge. When I want more of a broader, looser, less pressure on that sponge, I will hold it much further away at the end of that handle. Exactly how you would use a pencil or a paintbrush, the way that you use that soft tool, you're going to be able to apply your base layers in a slightly different way. Now, when I did this portrait, as I said, because it was a while ago now, I used my sanded soft pastel stick method. Now, my preference would be to use pan pastels, but this, as you can see, works perfectly fine. What you can do is if you don't have pan pastels, you can sand down your pastel sticks and use those and apply those to the paper in exactly the same way as your pan pastels. A tip when using that method with the soft pastel stick is to use a fine grade sandpaper. So you want something about a 320 grit. That will mean that the soft pastel stick will be sanded down in smaller like powdered sections rather than larger clumps of the soft pastel stick just being broken off, which can happen if you use much more of a coarser sandpaper. Now of course that method is messier than using pan pastels and I have found since using both options that the pan pastels do last significantly longer than a pastel stick. However, if you want to try and get a feel for whether or not you'd like to use pan pastels in how they are applied to the paper but you don't want to invest in those straight away then sanding down your soft pastel sticks would be a good option. So if you've seen my other videos here on YouTube, you'll know that I like to get my base foundation accurate and as well established as I can before I move on to my details. Now what I'm currently working on here is in small sections. So after my base layer, I will do a layer of refinement on top with my pastel pencils and then I will use my pencils for my details. Once I've got my pan pastel or here the sanded soft pastel stick base layer, I don't jump straight into my details. I want to be building up the depth here gradually and I do find that by layering in this way I achieve the most out of my base layer and my pastel pencil details. At all times when I'm working on my base layer and my details I'm always following that reference photo with that fur direction. When I do my base layer with my soft pastel sticks or my eye makeup sponges, I always am still moving those applicators in the direction of the fur. There are a couple of reasons for that, but the main one is if I'm studying what that fur direction is looking like in that reference photo very early on from my first layer, I find that I'm able to build up that muscle memory with my finger and the pencil or my soft tools so that when you then go in with your future layers, you're already used to doing that movement of the fur direction. So I do find it's easier to then follow that reference photo even closer. It's also the reason why I don't put one solid base layer down. You'll notice here as I work on the ear, I'm really paying attention to where my lights and my darks are. I'm not focusing on the exact colour, but I do want to make sure that I've got my lights and my darks in the right place. This is going to make it far easier for this layer of refinement here to follow that reference photo closely. And I really can't stress that enough, I do think it's really important. This here is quite a challenging texture to get right. All of the fur is overlapping in so many different places. You've got quite longer fur here as well, which again can add complexity to your details. But by breaking it up into individual layers, your longer details on top and building up your values gradually, one element that starts to look very complex actually becomes simpler.
If you put one solid base layer down from the start, it is far harder to follow that reference photo accurately. So if you do find yourself hesitating a lot on your base layer stage, map in more of your lights and your darks. Don't put one solid layer down. And as I've already mentioned, work in smaller sections. If we start focusing on one large area, it becomes very overwhelming. I only focus really on a couple of square inches at a time. Once I've done the eye here, you'll see that again, just like what I did on the left side, I will map in the base layer around the eye, but I'm not gonna focus on anything else other than that. All of these elements, the processes, the layering technique, how I'm using the pencil, all of these things that are discussed in my YouTube videos are far easier to demonstrate and explain in my slower tutorials on Patreon. Now I do have a mixture there of pet portraits and wildlife subjects because I do want to try and get as many of the dogs, cats and horses and subjects there as I can for members who do want to do pet portraits themselves. I have a Patreon library on my website which lists all of the tutorials on the tiers there that are available so that you can see the kind of content that I've got there before you sign up. So if that is of interest I will link my Patreon in the description below. I also have a video here on YouTube and it's my top tips for drawing realistic fur. I will link that in the description below as well if that's of interest. One of the things that I talk about there is your fur direction, your fur length and fur thickness. And here is a prime example. I want the fur around the eyes to look a little softer than the fur that's on the top of the head. As we get across to the ears, that needs to be far more textured. So I need to vary how I use my pencils and that layering technique. Now 90% of the time I will work from dark to light. There are always going to be an exception but for something like this as you can see I'm really focusing on building my darker base layer with those beautiful burnt sienna and orange colours and then I'm gradually building up my lighter layers from there. We want to be building up with the fur that is closest to the skin and working our way up from there. So when you're looking at your reference photo, try and ignore all of the brightest details that we can see. They need to be left until the very last layer. So it's this layer now that I'm currently working on where I am starting to focus on the details that are sitting on the very top, more of my brighter highlights. Notice how I'm using some purples and pinks here. Just like with the shadows, we don't always want to use one set colour. So in with a black, you might layer some of the blues or purples in there to get a little bit more of a richer depth of colour. That's going to be exactly the same for your highlights. You don't want to just be using white everywhere because you see it as a lighter colour. You also want to be cross-referencing your highlights and your contrast. Now what I mean by that is frequently zoom out of your reference photo and think, right, what part of the fur is actually the lightest part and compare that to the area that you're currently working on. The reason being, it's very easy, for instance, like the highlights above the eye, to think of those at that one section that you're working on as a lighter highlight. You then accidentally, in some cases, make it too bright, and then it's going to be matching some of the lighter values on the left ear. That there, I did overlap some of my white details on top. So you want to make sure that you are always cross-referencing your own work with that reference photo to double-check that you're not just putting the same type of highlight everywhere. So when it comes to the bridge of the nose and around the muzzle, the fur on most breeds is going to be naturally shorter. Unlike the exception of cockapoos and those type of breeds where the fur is curly and very thick around the muzzle, breeds like this it's usually much shorter. So I want to make sure that I'm showing that from my base layer stage. You can see here with my layer of refinement that I'm still keeping my pencil strokes nice and short. Again, this is going to help with me replicating that texture when I come to put my details on top. In some cases, for instance, if you're drawing some big cats, you've got your tigers and your lions, sometimes on the bridge of the nose, it's barely just dots. You don't want to actually draw individual lines. Of course, that's going to again depend on the reference photo that you're working from. But the most important thing is that you're capturing the difference in texture by adjusting your pencil strokes. This is also going to vary depending on the breed of dog that you're working on. So take breeds like the bulldog and the, the pug. They're known as what is brachycephalic. So that's where their nose is quite short. You've got that scrunched up type of appearance. That's going to make the fur section on the bridge of the nose very, very short. So that is going to have a very quick change of fur direction to show that the anatomy on those breeds is significantly different. So that's where the fur direction, the fur length are very, very important. 
And on this cavalier here, if I didn't shorten my pencil strokes around the nose and on the muzzle, I would make it look like this part of the face is really hairy, just like the top of the head and the ears, which of course is not the texture that this breed has. So adjusting your pencil length is as important as the fur direction. And when it comes to working on this side of the face, you'll notice that eventually I start building my lighter layers so it's a gradually a little bit brighter than the left side that I've just worked on. If you look at the finished portrait in the corner, you can see that the right side of the muzzle and the right ear is generally a couple of shades lighter than the left side of the face. This is going to be really important to show the viewer exactly where that the light source is travelling from. So when I'm working on the details here on my next layer, as I am at the moment, I'm then looking back over to the left side of my drawing to make sure that this current section I'm working on is lighter. That for me is really important. You'll know that I speak a lot about the contrast and the light source in all of my videos. I worry about that far more than the exact colour. And while we're on the subject of colour, you might have five, six, seven photos of that one pet that you've been asked to draw and the colour of the fur will be different in every single photograph. It's going to vary depending on whether or not a flash was used, was the photo taken outside, was it natural light, was it artificial light, maybe was it sunnier that day or was it overcast. There are so many different things that affect the overall colour of a photograph. So here again, it's one of the reasons why I want to go with my contrast. I could draw Freddy here with a blue or a purple tint. He would still look realistic because I've got my contrasts right. It would just make it look like he's sat under artificial lighting. So all of these things all come together. They play a huge part. Now I want to of course get the colour as close to the reference photo as I can. There are a couple of tools that you can use to make that process easier such as an eyedropper tool and then you can create a colour swatch. Now this is something I have a dedicated tutorial on on Patreon where you can isolate specific colours in your reference photo. You can then drag out those colours into a larger area so you can see exactly the type of colour that you need to be creating for the area that you're working on. How to know which colour to select and how to mix the layers, how to mix your pencils to create that specific colour is something that I go in depth in my Patreon tutorials. How you layer there is going to get a different look. So let's say you use the same combination of pencils for one portrait, you use the same pencils for another portrait but you've layered them slightly differently. You will be able to get a different colour because it's going to depend on how much pigment of one colour has been transferred to the paper, how much pressure you're putting on that pencil to mix with that pigment there are so many different factors there so again this is something that I do focus a lot on in depth in my patreon tutorials so one question I get asked a lot on YouTube is whether I use a fixative now this is something that I personally don't like to do because it can really adjust the color and tonal values of your portrait where we do spend so many hours, days, often weeks on one piece, I don't then want to get that ruined by applying a fixative on top. I use pastel matte paper that is designed not to be used with a fixative because of how it grips the pastel. A fixative is just not necessary. Uh, but if you do want to use a fixative, I would recommend using light layers and then use multiple layers. Build up that fixative gradually rather than doing one heavy layer. The reason being I did that once because that's what the bottle said. You only had to do one layer as a final fixative and it just made my details dissolve. That I then said I would never use a fixative again. Once I mount this work and I then ask my clients to frame it and it's protected behind glass, there's going to be no issues with this portrait smudging. I've also found with the fixatives that I've used that they don't actually 100% seal that portrait to the paper. You can still run your finger or a cotton bud across the surface and still have that pigment transferred. So for me, why would I take the risk with ruining that artwork if it's not actually going to 100% seal it? That is just my personal preference and of course there is no real right or wrong answer. You will find what you're comfortable with doing but I personally don't like using them. So for this section here, Freddy is actually resting his head on his owner's shoulder. So he's being carried. This is making the skin around the neck to be really scrunched up here. This is one of the parts where it can sometimes be a little bit confusing and our brain can play tricks on us. 
If you're finding that you're struggling with one area, regardless of what it is, turn your artwork upside down and your reference photo upside down and that will force your brain to see that image as abstract shapes rather than the neck fur or whatever it is that you're working on. That's something that can really help. Something as well that's really important that I speak in depth with on the Patreon tutorials is your layering order. Depending on one element of your portrait that's sitting in front or on top, you have to make sure that you draw in the area underneath it. And that there on the neck was a prime example. Those longer ear details at the end had to overlap the neck to show that the ear is in front of that part of the body. So I had to draw in the neck first so that I could overlap those details of the ear. So do always think one step ahead when you're working on elements like that because if I'd have started drawing the details of the ear first and then work on the neck I'd have to draw around all of those finer ear details which will make the process far more complicated and longer than it should be. So one last tip in this video is leave your whiskers till your last layer until you know you've got that one section where the whiskers are overlapping complete. Just like what I've said with the ear. I've added the whiskers on the right side of the face because I knew I'd finished but I had to draw in the coat on this man's shoulder first and then I could draw the whiskers that overlap this section of the coat. Again drawing the whiskers in too soon is just going to make the entire process far more complicated. I do like adding the whiskers in, I think they make a huge difference to the portrait, but do resist that temptation of adding them in too early. So I really hope the tips and techniques that I've shared in this video are useful. If they were, I would really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube very soon. You can see my finished portrait and my reference photo in the corner there. And as mentioned, if my slower in-depth tutorials in pastels and acrylics are of interest, I'll link my Patreon in the description below. If you've got any art-related questions, pop them in the comments. I'm more than happy to help if I can. And as always, thank you so much for watching.